Hello, and welcome to Soothing Pod Sleep Stories. My name is Arif, and tonight I will be your guide as we dip into the utterly boring, snooze-worthy history of the great god Zeus. Oh, sorry, I meant to say Greek god because some of the choices that Zeus made were far, far from great. But really, can you blame him? He's allowed to make mistakes, just like us. I mean, who hasn't turned their wife into a fly? Or wiped out humanity with a giant flood? Or given Pandora that totally normal, and not at all notoriously dangerous box? Mistakes happen, after all. He is just a god. But before we dive into the many wonders of Zeus with this boring, boring journey through his many questionable exploits, let us find peace and comfort in the place we're in here and now. Gently, softly close your eyes. That is, if they're not closed already. At this point, they probably should be. Unless you sleep with your eyes open. Or are taking in the beautiful art we've created for you here. But you're not here for the artists. You're here for me. You're here to go on a magical journey with me to Mount Olympus, to the coast of Greece, to Zeus's domain. So, now, close your eyes and allow your body to sink into whatever comfortable surface you are lying on. It can be a bed, a couch, a carpet, even a hammock if you're so inclined. Well, and suspended. With your eyes closed, try and turn your attention to your breathing. And please, if you will, Remain breathing for the rest of this meditation session. Feel as the cool night air fills your lungs, providing nourishment for you. And as you exhale, feel the relaxation and peace that breath has provided you with. This may feel strange, but trust me on this next part. As you exhale, exhale out of your mouth, imagining yourself blowing up a large, dream bubble-shaped balloon. Feel that breath take the weight off of your chest and release it into the balloon. When you inhale, Inhale through your nose, pulling the balloon away from your lips. Helium is not in the equation here, folks. Once more, breathe out, blowing that precious little balloon up as much as you can, enjoying the feeling of that weight dissipating from your chest and leaving your body relax. Inhale through your nose, feeling the nourishing breath as it fills your lungs. Now, with your eyes closed, picture something with me. Imagine there is a tiny gray cloud hovering above you a cloud sent down by Zeus himself. The cool, calm cloud gently lowers down, down, 
down to your forehead, and as it does, a light rain begins to pitter-patter from it. The rain lightly brushes over your face and neck, relieving any tension you may have been carrying there. Your tongue falls away from the roof of your mouth. Your jaw unclenches. Your ears fall away from your shoulders, giving you a fully relaxed, comfortable position. Slowly, watch as the cloud makes its way down your torso. Your lungs expand and open and your heart slows to a steady, natural pace. Any tension you are carrying in your arms and hands melts away with the droplets of rain. The cloud drifts down, down, down to your legs and feet, washing them with a warm sprinkle and urging them to sink into the mattress. As the cloud slowly lifts up, Take notice of how your body feels now. Notice there is no tension you are carrying, no weight. You are allowed to simply be. Here, there is no to-do list. There are no obligations. You are allowed to just be. Now that we have taken the time to relax and find peace and comfort in where we are here and now, let us begin our story. Zeus's story began in typical ancient Greek fashion. There was a prophecy, a betrayal, and a man eating a rock thinking it was his child. After all, what is Greek mythology but a precursor to the modern-day soap operas that grace our screen? Zeus's parents, Cronus and Rhea, were titans. His father, Cronus, was the ruler of the world when the world was still fresh and new. There were no strip malls, no traffic, but also, devastatingly, no chicken nuggets. Yes, the world was a mosaic of cerulean seas that stretched in every direction to distant horizons. The fields were swaths of green and amber, speckled with bountiful wildflowers that swayed in the fresh, clean breeze. It was a place of magic, untouched lands. Birds flitted from tree to tree, basking in the light of the sun that shone down on them, casting golden cloaks of light across the land. And though the world was beautiful, full of opportunity and beauty, Cronus was far from focused on it. He wasn't the type to stop and smell the roses. Really, he wasn't the kind to notice the roses whatsoever. Because long ago, when Cronus took the throne from his own father, he was warned that one of his children would grow more powerful than him and take over his throne, and, in his defense, I imagine it was a pretty spectacular throne. If you are the ruler of the entire earth and cosmos, the least you can do 
is get yourself a little memory foam on your cold metal throne. When Cronus and Rhea's children came to be, Cronus gobbled them up one after the other, locking them in his stomach where they could never escape. But Rhea, being a sensible, normal person, could not bear the sight of her children disappearing at the hands of their father, desperate to save Zeus, her last child. She spirited him away, sending him to a distant mountain to be raised by a tribe of nymphs. In his place, Rhea provided Cronus with a large rock that was wrapped in a swaddling cloth. With no hesitation, Cronus lobbed the rock into the air as if it was a piece of popcorn and swallowed it. Satisfied that he had prevented the prophecy from coming to fruition. But, you see, the thing about prophecies is that, no matter what, they come true. The mountain where Zeus was raised was a wild, mesmerizing place. Cypress, olive, and oak trees scaled the side of the mountain painting it in strokes of emerald, sage, and evergreen. Wildflowers seemingly sprouted from the soil everywhere, peppering the world with an array of oranges, yellows, pinks, and reds. It was, without a shadow of the doubt, a paradise. Rivers meander down the mountain, pooling as waterfalls at the base of rocky cliff sides. One could stroll along the rivers and many waterfalls for hours, leaving their troubles behind as they soaked in the beauty and majesty of the landscape. Though he had, in a way, been banished from his home. Zeus was already living in some kind of kingdom from the time he was born. In the mountains, tucked back into tiny, cozy homes, Zeus was raised in secrecy. A warrior, Curetes, drowned out the sound of Zeus's crying by doing a battle dance where he clashed his shields loudly together with a ting, 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 ting. Next time there is a crying baby near you, remember this useful technique. I can guarantee you will soon forget all about the sound of the baby crying when your large, ancient metal shields are clanging together. The nymphs doted on Zeus, feeding his notorious ego from day one. They pampered him in the mountains, swaddling him in woven cloth and rocking him to sleep with music they played on their very own harps. He was nursed on the milk of Amalthea a goat. Clearly, he was ahead of the times. If he was born today, I can assure you he would be nursing on the finest oat milk the world has to offer. From a young age, it was clear to the nymphs that Zeus was not a normal baby. And, honestly, they should have gotten that from the very beginning when he was spirited to them. Zeus possessed super strength and intelligence, impressing the nymphs with how quickly he was able to walk and talk. 
Soon, Zeus was old enough to begin training himself like any young hero or warrior. Nearly every morning, he would emerge from his cave and unsheath a sword in the breathtaking golden light of the rising sun. In the nearby meadow, he practiced his steps. He would sway back and forth across the grass, slicing through the air with ease. He was adept with a sword, though he was not trained by anyone. He knew he had power coursing through his veins. He could feel it every time he was practicing his fighting against a tree, or a stump, or a pile of leaves. He knew that in time, a real battle awaited him. But in the meantime, the inanimate objects would have to do. His training lasted for several years. By then, he had explored the entire mountainside by himself. He loved the babbling brooks, the raging rivers, the wonderful waterfalls, the terrific trees, the darn cool dirt. Really, he felt the most connected to himself when he was in nature, Meandering through the beauty of the mountains was one of the only times when Zeus felt at peace. The sun shone down on his skin, warming his body and soul with its comforting rays. The breeze that swept off the top of the nearby ocean put him at peace, urging him to relax into himself and simply be. The life in the mountains was serene, the type of life that urged you to savor it rather than labor through it. Often after practicing his fighting skills, Zeus would plop down on a rock on the edge of the mountain and look out over the turbulent sea beyond him. The waves were a mosaic of dark blue, of cerulean, of turquoise and cornflower, all flowing and twirling together in unison. Though the adult Zeus would much rather look at women than the sea, Younger Zeus was much more focused on the beauty of the world around him. Soon, the time came. Zeus felt strong enough. All those days of breathing cool mountain air, gliding through meadows alive with wildflowers, and nursing from a magic goat, had prepared Zeus for his mission, a mission that had been foretold in a prophecy long, long ago. Zeus was to overthrow his father and save his siblings, but not yet fully embracing his godhood, he recruited the help of someone else, the powerful goddess Metis, Metis, a strong, beautiful winged goddess, was eager to help him in his quest. He knew to win the war against his parents, to win the war against the Titans, he would need his siblings, who were, in miraculous mythological fashion, still alive in their father's stomach. Cronus trusted Metis, though looking back, I'm sure he wishes he didn't. 
Metis presented him with a blue and purple drink in a chalice that was forged in their very own kingdom. She told Cronus that the drink would increase his power, but instead it forced him to dispel his children from his stomach. With his siblings by his side, Zeus was able to throw over Cronus in the war between the gods and the titans. In the end, the world belonged to the gods. Knowing sharing the earth was a large task, Zeus called upon his brothers Hades and Poseidon. They each drew for pieces of the world that would fall under their command. Hades drew for the underworld and got a bit of a bad rep for it. Someone has to draw the short stick after all. Poseidon went on to take over the sea, and in Greek mythology, never did have a daughter named Ariel. A missed opportunity, certainly. And Zeus, of course, received the heavens as his domain. He was given magical lightning bolts for his role, which I'm sure many people would rather he was never gifted. The rest of the gods knew that Zeus was not to be messed with, and yet they couldn't help it sometimes, because he did the strangest things when he was mad, usually with those lightning bolts. After the war was over between Zeus and his father, life settled into a place of peace for quite some time. The gods settled upon Mount Olympus, giving them endless views of Greece and the kingdoms that they called their own. The kingdom was drenched in gold, fine furnishings, and art. Music played from nowhere all the time, perhaps by speakers made to look like garden rocks, or elevators tucked just out of view. Regardless of where the music came from, Mount Olympus was a place of immense beauty, luxury, and wealth. Lush gardens surrounded the plush living quarters, gardens that contained every fruit and vegetable imaginable. Benches nestled in the shadows of impossibly tall rose bushes, whose fragrance flowed through the entire estate. It was a place that was undeniably fit for the gods and the fountains in the shape of them made that clear. Here, Zeus reigned as the god of thunder and the king of the gods. But of course, this was not something he could do alone. In awe of the power of Metis, Zeus called upon her to become his wife. Metis agreed naturally, because he was the king of the gods, and his beard was miraculous. For quite some time, the two enjoyed the best relationship any of the Greek pantheon could dream of. They didn't conspire behind each other's backs. They didn't turn anyone into an animal, yet and they didn't get rid of any humans to retaliate at one another. No, for many, many years, their relationship was a peaceful one. They lived in a beautiful home crafted of marble and the finest gemstones you can imagine. Their bed was a plush escape 
lined with swan and duck feathers that they sunk down into each night and slept in like gods. During the morning, when the first rays of sunshine washed over Mount Olympus, Zeus and Metis would often go for walks together through the lush garden. Metis would breathe in the sweet, serene aroma of the freshly opened roses. She loved the way the air smelled up here on the top of the earth, the way it smelled of citrusy pine trees, of lofty cedars, of the briny ocean that she could make out from the highest point in the garden. It was a place of utter peace, a place where they could connect and just be. But often, Zeus was much too wrapped up in his role as a god to pay attention to the beauty around him. He spoke to Metis in hushed, worried tones about how others were trying to seek his power. Metis knew this was true, but she also knew that Zeus and his siblings could handle whatever was thrown their way. She warned her husband not to dwell on it too deeply. After all, he was starting to sound like his own father, the father he had slain. But Metis did not realize how close her husband's story would be to his own father's, and how unfortunately her story would end. When Metis fell pregnant with her first child, she was overjoyed. Zeus spoke to her belly, telling her child that they would be powerful and strong, just like their father. But soon, a premonition told them that the child may be even more powerful than Zeus. It was foretold that Metis would have a daughter even wiser and more powerful than her mother, and a son that would overthrow Zeus and become the ruler of the cosmos. Zeus was devastated by this premonition. He knew he could not risk losing his seat of power like his own father had to him. And so, just like his father, he concocted a plan to swallow his own child. Metis had the power to transform into any being or animal at will. Knowing this was a surefire way to dispose of her, one day, Zeus sat with Metis at their table by a crackling fireplace to enjoy dinner. As the sun set behind them, washing the room with a rainbow of oranges, yellows, and pinks. Zeus swirled his glass of wine and playfully teased his wife. He told her the only way she could become more annoying to him that night in particular was if she was a fly buzzing in his ear. Eager to taunt her husband, Metis transformed herself into a fly. But as she sailed through the air to buzz at Zeus's side, his entire demeanor changed. With a mighty bite, he took the fly version of Metis into his mouth and swallowed her whole. Zeus not known for being the most empathetic of deities, rubbed his stomach and strolled off to bed, caring little about the wife and child he had just swallowed. 
As long as he remained in power, he was content with any choices he made, even if it involved eating flies. The least he could have done was urged her to turn into a hot dog or something. But soon, Zeus's nonchalant demeanor started to seemingly catch up with him. Pounding headaches consumed his life, forcing him to remain in bed or lounging in darkness most days. He could feel a strange pulsing inside his head, and at times, he swore he could hear the clanging of metal. The pain reached such a crescendo that Zeus hurried to the side of one of his warriors, begging them to split his head open to see what was going on inside. It was rough before MRIs came onto the scene, let me tell you. The warrior split Zeus's head open, and to his shock, a fully formed woman popped out. She wore remarkably strong armor and a stern, powerful look on her face. She introduced herself as Athena, the daughter of Zeus. She had been raised inside his head by her mother, Metis, and was banging her sword and shield together for years to gardener Zeus's attention so that she could be set free. Reluctant, but knowing this was not the child that was going to overthrow him, Zeus welcomed Artemis into the Greek pantheon. She was a noble goddess, the goddess of wisdom, warfare, and weapons. The aura that constantly radiated off her told everyone this, no matter what room she walked into. But even the gods get lonely, and Zeus was no exception. In no time, he had his eyes on Hera, another goddess, and though their marriage would far from be a happy one and would put several humans, demigods, and gods themselves in danger, neither of them could ignore the attraction they had for one another, although that attraction wasn't showcased at the very beginning of their relationship. Hera was Zeus's sister, and you'll have to forgive them for that. There were not a whole lot of gods floating around back in the day. Wanting her attention desperately, Zeus turned himself into a cuckoo bird to seduce Hera. In retrospect, perhaps Hera should have seen this as a shining example of how cuckoo her life would become if she married Zeus. At their wedding, every god was in attendance. The room was awash in layers and layers of white flowers that glistened in the light of the setting sun. As they took each other's hands and said their vows, they could see the beautiful valleys and rivers of Greece far, far below them, painting the landscape with a story that they had a large, wonderful part in. When Zeus and Hera kissed, beams of sunlight shined down on them, illuminating them in a breathtaking glow. Many of the gods in attendance genuinely clapped, while others clapped out of not wanting to be smoked. But it wasn't long before someone saw the land as empty as wanting more. 
Prometheus, the titan god of fire, crafted man and taught them how to use fire that was stolen from the gods of heaven themselves. Zeus was not one to be stolen from, and soon Prometheus found out. In classic Zeus fashion, he had Prometheus disposed of in a way that would surely awaken you from the peaceful slumber you are hopefully nearing. So I believe we are both better opting out of those details. In response, a frustrated Zeus did the most logical thing an early god could do. He decided there needed to be more than just men on earth. So he ordered Hera to create the first woman, Pandora. He urged Hera to create Pandora with a thirst for knowledge of all kinds. And, at the same time, he sent her down with a box full of troubles to plague mankind, ordering her not to open it. But Zeus knew the type of woman he had ordered Pandora be created to be. There was no chance that Pandora would be able to resist opening the box. She was a kid two weeks before Christmas who found her presence in the hallway closet. Can you really blame her for opening it? She was following the very nature of which she was founded. Pandora opened the box, and from that, the troubles of humankind began. Pandora apologized for the madness she sent forth on humanity, when in reality, Zeus had a rather big thing to do with it. He enjoyed passing blame, that one. You'll have to forgive him. There were no self-help books at the time. Humankind spread like a wildfire across the land. Zeus looked down upon them most days, and the majority of the time, he was horrified by what he was seeing. No one was kind, no one honored their gods, and none of them were faithful or righteous, except for a single couple. Deucalion and Pyrrha were much loved and respected by Zeus. They were pious, kind people who worshipped the gods and worked hard. Deciding that he was done with the problems of mankind, Zeus sent a massive flood to wipe everyone out except for Deucalion and Pyrrha. I'd like to believe they were on an ark of some kind, but the jury is still out on that one. After knowing that they could not survive on their own, Zeus sent bags of stones down to the couple. He urged them to toss the stones over their shoulders into the water where they would be transformed into humans that Deucalion and Pyrrha could raise to be pious, understanding, and respectful of the gods and the earth. The next many, many years of Zeus's life were filled with escapades much like this. As humankind grew, his interest in them grew as well. He had several flings with women, nymphs, and others on earth. Hera grew to be an eternally jealous wife, 
though Zeus was equally jealous of her. Zeus had quite a thing for humans, though it seemed he could only gain their affection by trickery or switching into animal form. Over the course of his long, strange, questionable life, he transformed into a bull to earn Europa's affections, a swan to connect with Leda, and a sate to connect with Antiope. It's possible they didn't like the beard otherwise, but unfortunately, we will never know their true feelings on Zeus. When Zeus wasn't seducing women, he spent much of his time coming up with ways to punish those that he disliked. And if anything, you cannot deny that Zeus was creative. I hope you have enjoyed this sleep story and it has brought you a night of peaceful sleep. Please, join me again tomorrow night for another sleep story. Until then, sweet dreams. <laughs>